and welcome to this special session to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Einstein's discovery of his general theory of relativity. This was a remarkable theory which revolutionized our understanding of space, time, and gravity. Even today, it continues to fascinate and challenge us. In this session, we'll start with a talk giving an overview of the field. Then we'll have two talks describing the current observational status of two of the um, important consequences of general relativity. After a short break, there'll be two additional talks describing our current understanding of how to extend general relativity to make it compatible with quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, due to the logistics, we won't be able to take questions after individual talks. Um, I'm embarrassed after Spenta's introduction because he advised me earlier today not to give extended introductions to the speakers, uh, but instead referred people to the fact that in this uh, little booklet, which many of you have, and there's some more copies up here, it's all on the website, there are uh, more extended bios of our uh, speakers today. Let me just assure you that they're all extremely distinguished physicists, and we're extremely grateful that they all agreed to be with us today. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, who won the Nobel Prize in 2004. Uh, please welcome David Gross from the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. Okay. <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, bringing to an end what has been a fantastic conference, and I congratulate the organizers and all the participants, many of whom I see here, but I didn't expect to see in this talk, which is really aimed at a, at a more general audience. Uh, and of course, as has been said, we've come here today to discuss what I call the enduring legacy of Albert Einstein, one of the great giants of physics, who a hundred years ago more or less, um, completed his monumental theory of general relativity, of, of gravitation and space-time, which we continue to, of course, one of the pillars of modern physics, which, whose frontiers we continue to explore, even at this very conference. Now, Einstein is quite a uh, celebrated figure throughout the world, throughout history. This is a, perhaps, the most beautiful portrait of him, which was done, as you can see, in his later years, which is mostly how, how people remember him as an old man. This is uh, somewhat before, while he was trying very hard to unify all the forces of nature and not succeeding. Uh, this is Einstein in his 40s, after, in the years after he developed the general theory of relativity. And, um, but this is Einstein when he started out as a clerk in the patent office in Bern. Uh, perhaps he was 25 then. And of course, it is a his efforts that culminated in the miraculous year of 2005, which we celebrated only the centenary um, 10 years ago, where he dropped at least three big bombshells on the physics community and became uh, a very famous theoretical physicist. In 2005, among the rest, in addition to doing his Nobel Prize winning work on quantum mechanics, he uh, set forth the theory of special relativity, which um, has been the basis of our understandings of the global symmetries of space and time ever since. Again, if one thinks of his enduring legacy, that which transcends the specifics of the theories he was discussing at the time. What Einstein really did in 1905 was revolutionize how we view symmetry. Symmetries have played an incredibly important role in the development of 20th century physics, 
They're at the heart of our understanding of the forces of nature. But it was Einstein who really gave us the modern perspective on symmetries. His great advance was really to put symmetry first, to regard symmetry principles as the primary feature of nature that constrains the allowed dynamical laws. Thus, the transformation properties of the electromagnetic field, which he based his, his advances on, were not to be derived from Maxwell's equations as Lorentz tried to do and attribute them to properties of uh, ether, which Einstein was happy to do away with, but rather as co the symmetries were consequences of relativistic invariance of the properties of space-time. And the symmetries indeed dictate the form of Maxwell's equations and all other laws of physics. This is a profound change of attitude, but one that we have been following with great success uh, in the 110 years since special relativity. More specifically, Einstein in 1905, unified space and time. The mathematicians following him did this a little more precisely, but contained in his great advance of special relativity was the notion that one cannot think of time as an absolute clock beating at the same rate everywhere in the universe. It is unified with space, and most importantly, there is no absolute notion of simultaneity. This picture of the future of the event A, uh, these are light rays, nothing can travel faster than light, and thus the event C in space and time is what we call space-like with respect to A. No signal can propagate from A to C, and in fact, there is no meaning to the relative time of these two events. Different observers might, one might say that A precedes C, but an observer moving in an equally valid uh, inertial frame would say that C precedes A in time. This was a total revolution in the way we think of time and space. And the theory of relativity, given that it was built on the immensely successful theory of electricity and magnetism expressed in Maxwell's equations, of course, was grandly successful. And the uh, physicists who bought into it, and like all advances, you know, maybe half the physicists loved it immediately and half of them hated it. And, but those who bought into it immediately started to relativize, make consistent with the notion of special relativity, all existing physical theories. There was one outstanding problem which Einstein recognized immediately and started to work on. And that was, well, there were actually two outstanding issues in his mind. One was obvious. All if his theory of special relativity was to be a feature of nature, then all specific dynamical laws of motion had to be consistent with Einstein's principles. And the most famous law uh, that we've had since Newton, the prime example of a force law that with Newton's equations gives rise to, to uh, particle motion, uh, is Newton's theory of gravity. So the first obvious problem that Einstein and others had to face was how to reconcile Newton's theory of gravity with special relativity. But there was a more, there was another thing that bothered Einstein immediately, and that was um, the extension of his idea of relativity, the principle of relativity beyond inertial frames, frames that observers that are moving at constant velocity with respect to one another. He felt somehow that space and time could not be absolute 
in, in any sense, and that accelerated observers, and most observers, I mean, if I walk like this, I'm accelerating with respect to you all. I, what is special about your frame of reference? You're actually, well. Um, so Einstein was motivated to extend his principle of relativity to include accelerated observers. And he addressed this problem head on and indeed laid the nuggets of his theory of general relativity and his theory of gravity in a seminal paper published only about a year after the uh, theory, uh, a year after uh, special relativity in 1907, where he asks, is it conceivable that the principle of relativity, the equivalence of different observers, all observers, applies to systems which are accelerated with respect to one another. Now, reconciling Newton's theory of gravity or special relativity might seem straightforward. Newton's theory of gravity is based on action at a distance. If you move the Earth, the Moon immediately feels a changed force its acceleration changes, its motion will be altered. At a distance, faster than the speed of light. That's inconsistent with special relativity. So Einstein, as he says in his Recollections of History, 1933, I tried to establish a field law for gravitation. Since it was no longer possible to introduce direct action at a distance, because of the abolition of the notion of absolute simultaneity. These two points, the Earth, the Moon, are examples of events that um, have, there, it, it is meaningless in special relativity to say that the Earth is here at the same time that the Moon is there. And that you move the Earth, you feel, the Moon feels that immediately. But the way to deal with that was obvious. You simply introduce not a, such a direct action law as Newton did, but rather a field theory of gravity in which when you move the Earth, some disturbance some in the vacuum, some field that lives everywhere in space-time is affected by the source of gravity, mass, gravitational mass, and waves propagate and transmit the information that the Earth has moved to the Moon at the velocity of light, presumably. But these attempts didn't work. And Einstein remarks that the straightforward approach, i.e., to introduce a scalar field for the Newtonian potential, this is my IE, but not his, uh, whose source was the mass density. Actually, I don't think he ever published this uh, these attempts, but many others did, including Nordstrom, a more, slightly more sophisticated version of scalar conformal gravity, was not consistent with the equality of gravitational and inertial masses. And this was a principle that the source of gravity, the gravitational mass that sources, would source the gravitational field, and the inertial mass that responds to force according, gives rise to acceleration according to Newton's second law, were the same with the appropriate choice of units. Now Einstein already knew in 1907 E equals mc squared that the mass of an object is measured by its full energy content including the energy due to self-gravity and that the theory of gravity therefore had to be nonlinear. You just, you couldn't just follow this straightforward line and be consistent with this fact that Einstein regarded as essential. Now, the fact that gravitational and inertial masses are the same has a long history and is not at all obvious. In fact, Aristotle believed that heavier bodies fall faster. Obviously, because that's what you see when you drop certain bodies in air. Uh, but, as you all know, this changed with the birth of modern science, and in particular Galileo, who disagreed with that. 
Aristotelian point of view. And famously, the myth that is propagated uh, is that Galileo came to this realization by dropping bodies, stones, off the Tower of Pisa. Uh, most historians believe that this is a myth, as I do, because if you look at the dialogue of uh, two worlds, you find a passage where Simplicio asks, did you actually do the experiment? <laughs> now, Galileo was a great experimentalist, but in my opinion, he was a greater theorist, and he said, no, and I do not need it, as without any experience, I can affirm that it is so, because it cannot be otherwise. <laughs> Proving he was a theoretical physicist. This is an attitude many of us follow nowadays. <laughs> it's dangerous. I'm, I'm sure Aristotle said exactly the same thing. But Galileo's argument, if you haven't seen it, is really very cute. He said, well, consider a heavy body and a light body made of the same kind of material. And uh, drop them. Well, Aristotle tells us, of course, that the heavy body will fall faster and arrive at the ground earlier. OK? Now, make a third body by putting the heavy body and the light body together, gluing them together. What's going to happen now if you drop all three? Well, this heavy body is going to be retarded, held back by the light body. On the other hand, this light body is going to be pulled down by the heavy body. So clearly, the heavy body will fall faster Heavy light will fall in between, average. Light body will come down last. On the other hand, let's say I just had given you this heavy light body as a heavier body. Now I drop them. Well, this is the heaviest one. It's going to come down first, and then the heavy, and then the light. Totally contradicting the previous result. And Galileo argued the only consistent is that they all fall with exactly the same acceleration. So some historians argue that he might very well have done the Tower of Pisa, Pisa as a demonstration, not as an experiment. But either way, he discovered that all bodies fall with the same acceleration the gravitational mass and the inertial mass are the same. So when you divide the force proportion of the gravity, you get the same acceleration for all bodies. And this is known as, sometimes known as the equivalence principle, or the equality of gravitational and inertial masses. And it has been tested with extraordinary accuracy now for one part in a trillion. Newton actually knew this, of course, built on Galileo's advances, took this into account in his theory of gravity, and tested it. As did Bessel, finally Atlas did the most unbelievably precise experiments in the end of the 19th century, and Einstein knew that very well. But not only did he know it, you know, it's not clear that Newton regarded this as anything but a coincidence, but Einstein thought it must contain the clue to gravity. And then in 1907, as he describes it, he had his famous thought experiment, the most famous Gedanken or thought experiment in the history of science, in my opinion. Uh, it's sometimes called the elevator thought experiment. What happens to an observer falling in an elevator? He drops something, it doesn't move, so he feels he's freely fallen observer, looks like there's no gravity. We've all, to some degree, experienced that feeling. Actually, Einstein's metaphor was not falling in an elevator, but he thought, as he describes, what happens if a man falls off a roof? Before he hits the ground, what is his description of physics like? I think the roof, this, the roof, the roof, it 
disappeared because you know there were reporters who went and talked to Einstein and they started asking about the roof and whether there was straw at the bottom and what happened here. And he decided <laughs> elevators are safer. <laughs> but anyway, his thought experiment you all know. He considers two systems, S1, a rocket, moving with uh, <clears throat> acceleration G and a uh, same system at rest. He says, these two, let S1 be accelerated with an acceleration G, and S2 should be at rest but located in a gravitational field that imparts to all objects an acceleration minus G. And he realized there's no way of distinguishing these two situations. In this, in this frame of reference, the accelerated observer drops objects. They seem to accelerate downwards with an acceleration minus g with respect to him. This observer drops objects. They're pulled down by the gravitational field with an acceleration minus g. And Einstein realized thereby what we now call the equivalence principle. As far as we know, the physical laws with respect to S1 do not differ from those with respect to S2, as far as we know. And this is based on the fact that all bodies are equally accelerated in the gravitational field. At our present state of experience, we thus have no reason to assume that the systems S1 and S2 differ in any respect. And in the discussion following, this is reprinted, I think, in this book, we shall assume the complete physical equivalence of a gravitational field and a corresponding acceleration of the reference system. It's the first statement of the equivalence principle. As Einstein said, this was the happiest thought of my life. He was seated at the, bur at the patent office, bored. Suddenly, this experiment came to his mind, and he realized that this was the secret of both the ability to relate observers which are moving with relative acceleration one to another, and perhaps to explain gravity as a consequence of the, chain, the, chain, uh, the change of frame of reference. Now from 1907, end of 1907 to the end of 1915 is seven or eight years, took him about eight. And why did it take so long? Well, the case he considered to begin with, a homogeneous, constant gravitational field is an idealization, and it's rather difficult mathematically and conceptually to generalize that to arbitrary observers with arbitrary accelerations. And uh, as Einstein said, the road to the, well, the road to the final four theory was long and difficult, and Einstein explains that in one of his, perhaps it's uh, also in the book, one of his reminiscences about the history of general relativity. He said, why were seven years required for the construction of the general theory of relativity? Because really, the physics, the basic physical idea was there, 1907. Well, part of the answer is that the mathematics involved required tools that existed, Riemann and others had, had, had uh, constructed uh, differential theory of differential geometry to describe uh, the properties of space-time that he needed, but they were unfamiliar to him and to most people, and that was difficult. But the real reason, Einstein explains, was that fact that it is not easy to free oneself from the idea that coordinates, the actual labels we put on events of space and time, have a direct significance. Which is, which is what we learn from general relativity. It's still not easy. We still struggle with that all the time and run into trouble because it's not easy, especially at the quantum level.
But finally, after eight years, Einstein arrived at Einstein's equations, centenary of which we are celebrating this year. And here they are. Uh, for those who know them, they're beautiful. For those who don't, they're beautiful. <laughs> this, the right-hand side describes properties of space-time, the Ramanian curvature, how space-time curves. Uh, this is the metric tensor, which defines distances between events in space and time. And this is the source of gravity, the energy and momentum carried by particles. Uh, this is Newton's constant, measures the strength of the gravitational force. This is the velocity of light, which enters into all relativistic theories. And this was finally published, no refereeing. I mean, the paper was submitted Thursday and published Saturday <laughs> in the Proceedings of the Prussian Academy of Sciences, where Einstein was at the time in Berlin, November 25th, 1930. This was the third or fourth of the papers he had written in November, boom, 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 as he was finally gotten over the mathematical obstacles and was completing the theory. Some of the other papers in 1915, just before 25th dealt with the experiment. General relativity, you know, this mathematical theory of gravity of space-time. Einstein was being guided and motivated by experiment all the time. And uh, in the papers of that month, he addresses three of the famous experimental tests. One is the deflection of light. Massive bodies attract light, they deflect. You could measure that, perhaps, during eclipses. Uh, he'd actually, in 1907, that same paper where he introduced the equivalence principle, had calculated the deflection of light incorrectly. He made mistakes. He got half the value, in a sense, the Newtonian value. Luckily, nobody could measure it for many years. So he, by 1915, when the final form was there, uh, in November 18th, he published the right number, which is twice as big. And that, as you all know, was confirmed only four years later, right after World War I, by Eddington and others, measured the deflection of light during an eclipse, right on the nose. Some people argue it was too good an agreement. Whatever, we know that now, with much more precision, that it was right. So, not sure why people are so picky about Eddington. In any case, this. <laughs> This is uh, what made Einstein famous, uh, right uh, in 1919. But what Einstein was really motivated for was not only a prediction of something that hadn't yet been measured, but a postdiction of something much like the Higgs that had been predicted in 1859. <coughs> and this was, was it uh, 55, six years later? It took a long time. And that's what he really wanted to be able to calculate. And he developed all the mechanism for doing this with, before he had the right equations with Grossman, so that when he had the right equations, even a week before he published them in November 18th, he did the calculation and it came right on the nose. It was a well-measured uh, phenomena violating, in violation of Newton's theory. And I have no doubt that gave him enormous, enormous confidence. Then, of course, there was the redshift uh, in, the in a gravitational field, which wasn't really measured until much later. Now, I want to turn to what I call Einstein's legacy. Now, Einstein didn't believe his theory was forever. He was a very good physicist. And his equations aren't forever. They're like Newton's equations, extremely good approximations in certain circumstances, but they're not part of the final story, and he knew it. So I want to discuss briefly three of his contributions that, in my opinion, will live forever and guide our everyday uh, theoretical physics today. One of them is I call dynamical space-time. The second is physical cosmology. And the third uh, are the unified theory. 
So Einstein's revolutionary advance culminated in 1915, started in 1907, was to realize that space-time is not inert, but dynamical. It's sourced by sources, energy and momentum. It responds, the metric of space-time responds to those sources. Space-time is curved by mass and energy and affects the motion of bodies moving in space-time. A revolutionary point of view. Until then, space and time, in Newton's case, were rigid, fixed, non-dynamical, and absolute. In special relativity, they weren't absolute. There were equivalent inertial frames, but space and time were rigid and non-dynamical. Now, once space and time is dynamical, then one can ask about the dynamics of space and time. And indeed, this started almost immediately. As soon as Einstein published that paper, after, two days after it was submitted, people started looking for solutions of those equations that described curved space-time with or without sources. <coughs> and the most interesting one is one which, among the rest, describes black holes. This particular metric, Schwarzschild solution, discovered by Carl Schwarzschild a month later, I think, or two months, just before he died on the Western Front. Remember, 1915 was in the middle of this incredible world, world war. Um, now, this solution of Einstein's equations describes what space and time looks like far away from the source, the star, the particle, the whatever, that has mass and creates distorts space and time metric, but it also, as was learned painfully over decades and never believed by Einstein, described something pretty weird called a black hole, where the gravity is so intense that light can't escape and we still are pondering its mysteries. Now, black holes, which Einstein didn't believe in, again, because he, he too suffered his whole life from not truly being able to, um, to step back and not regard the space-time coordinates as real. And he thought they were totally unphysical, turned out to be real physical objects that are abundant throughout the universe. And astrophysics now must take them into account, use them, explore them. They affect every galaxy. This is a black, the trajectories of stars around the black hole in our galaxy, uh, where we're hoping to go even further in and learn about properties of highly curved space-time, as well as gamma ray bursts, which are believed to be the remnants of Supernova explosions forming a black hole which powers the stuff falls into it, these jets, uh, which we can see in galaxies far, far away. And then, of course, these black holes are the subjects of famous thought experiments and still guide our investigation into the properties of, of space-time especially after Hawking's discovery that in quantum theory, black holes are not that black. They actually emit thermal radiation and decay and disappear. And the properties of such things is one of our, our most powerful thought experimental tools in discovering uh, the properties of quantum gravity. Now, Einstein had no problems with quantum gravity because he didn't believe in quantum mechanics. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want, but the naive application of quantum mechanics to Einstein's theory has always run into problems. And um, once I did some historical research on Einstein's, uh, you know, why was Einstein so resistant to quantum mechanics? And all these wonderful things were happening in particle <laughs> physics and relativistic quantum field theory, Einstein paid no attention at all. Pauli, however, explained that. He said, you know, if we had had 
a quantized version of Einstein's theory, the discussion with him would have been much simpler. <laughs> I think Einstein felt, I can ignore quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum field theory, because they can't quantize my theory. If they were to come to me and say, here's a quantum version of your theory, now what do you have to say? Uh, there would have been some dialogue. But from the beginning, there were problems in doing that. And it's because the, in quantum mechanics, every dynamical object fluctuates, including, in the case of gravity, space-time itself fluctuates, and in a way characterized by some characteristic scale of the theory. The characteristic scale in the case of gravity is defined by Newton's constant and is at a very short distances. And at that distance, these fluctuations appear uncontrollable, at least in the normal approach. Some people have called this space-time foam. If we actually look at the dynamics of space-time with a very, very good microscope, which we don't have, we would see who the hell knows what. And we would have to go beyond Einstein's theory. And we do. We try to, at least for the last uh, 40 years or more. That's what string theory is all about. And Einstein introduced dynamical space-time. Quantum mechanics is there, unavoidable. We have to deal with what is the true nature of quantum space-time. And that's one of the key topics that string theorists, quantum gravi gravitationers are dealing with. Today we're going to hear from Juan some ideas about emergent space-time in quantum mechanics. Now let me come to Einstein's second enduring legacy, and that's physical cosmology. Before Einstein, cosmology, the history of the universe, was, a, was addressed by religion and philosophy, but not by physics. I mean, how would you do it? After Einstein, the structure and the history of the universe is the subject of physics. Maybe down to and including the beginning of the universe and the end of the universe. We don't know. But it's a subject of physics. And Einstein knew this immediately, 1915, and started working on it. And only about a year or so later published the first paper, as far as I know, on a theory of the universe using the setting of general relativity. He was very tentative about this. He, he, writes, he wrote to Ehrenfest, from the standpoint of astronomy, of course, I've erected but a lofty castle in the air. For me, though, it was a burning question whether the relativity concept, this whole framework of general relativity, can be followed through to the finish or whether it leads to contradictions. I am satisfied now that I was able to think the idea through to completion without encountering contradictions. However, now that I'm no longer, now I'm no longer played with a problem, while previously it gave me no peace. You can see Einstein at work here. Just. But then he wrote, I've perpetuated something again in gravitation theory which exposes me a bit to the danger of being committed to the madhouse. <laughs> it's very tentative. I mean, no one, as far as I know, really seriously tried to construct the model of the universe. And whether the model I have formed for myself corresponds to reality is another question about which we will show probably never gain information. How ironic today, especially given the next two talks, which will tell you about how we're now testing uh, Einstein's theory and its generalizations and its extensions to what has developed in the last hundred years since Einstein is a rather complete description of the dynamics, the formation, the inflation, the whole history of the universe over the last 13.7 billion years. An amazing development, but one with, without general relativity wouldn't have been able to start. Einstein also provided some of the tools. In a beautiful paper, he showed that light deflection could be used to develop a theory of lensing of matter as and from that lensing, one could you detect. He never believed that one would ever detect the gravitational lenses, but now they're used as tools to explore the structure of dark matter, which by its very name is dark. It doesn't emit radiation, but it bends light 
So given the bending of the light, you can map out the distribution of masses. Now, of course, in his paper, he also introduced the cosmological constant. He wanted to construct a universe that was like Aristotle. He knew for a fact that the universe is unchanging and static and eternal. Obviously, what else? Totally wrong, but obvious. To do that is not easy in general relativity. The universe, as people discovered within a few years, tends to expand or contract, but not be static. He had a balance, the matter and energy density in the universe with a cosmological constant. And he didn't like that. As I have shown in the cosmology paper, the general theory of relativity requires the universe to be spatially finite. But this view of the universe necessitated the introduction of a new universal constant, we now call lambda, standing in a fixed relation to the total mass of the universe. This is gravely detrimental to the formal beauty of the theory. Now, actually, uh, I don't see that. It's, a, uh, it's a actually, by his principles, an allowed property of dynamical space-time. The only thing weird about it is its value, which we can't deal with. But he didn't like it because he wanted simplicity. And that brings me to his final contribution, which is so important to those of us engaged in speculative science, his search for a unified theory. So Einstein always regarded his specific theory of gravity as provisional. And he says so explicitly. But also, in fact, he was, you know, he, he'd modify anything in the ensuing decades in his unsuccessful attempt to construct a unified theory. But he had a definite goal the strongest stated goal I've ever seen any physicist ever state. The supreme test of the physicist is to arrive at those universal elementary laws of nature from which the cosmos can be built by pure deduction. My definition of the goal of physics. But even more, nature is constituted so that it is possible to lay down such strong determined laws that within those laws only rationally, completely determined constants occur. Not constants, parameters that you could change without completely destroying the theory. That was his goal. He never remarks when this will be achieved, but that was the goal. And his theory, you know, was deficient. It had this beautiful right-hand side, left-hand side, you know, a consequence of the profound symmetries of general relativity, but it also had this ugly, arbitrary, and singular right-hand side that described matter. And he didn't like that. And what that means for many of us is that if we don't like something, it looks beautiful, it looks ugly, or arbitrary, or singular, we now say naturalness, or this, or that. Same idea. It's a sign that something is missing, wrong with the theory, needs to be changed. And Einstein tried, after, you know, ten, about 10 years after this great year we're celebrating, he tried to construct a unified theory that would address this problem and create matter, perhaps as non-singular solutions to nonlinear field equations, that was his main goal, main strategy, uh, for 30 years without any success. Without much success. But for all of us working along the same dangerous lines of trying to unify and remove the arbitrariness, the singularities, and the free parameters, we should all remember Einstein's encouragement and warning. The successful attempt to derive delicate laws of nature along a purely mental path by following a belief in the formal unity of the structure of reality encourages continuation in this speculative direction. The dangers of which everyone vividly must keep in sight who dares follow it. 
So this is great advice. In Einstein time, there weren't many people doing this. Today, there are perhaps more. Uh, but the dangers of which we must all keep in mind while following this goal. We, of course, now have had enormous success in fundamental physics in unifying all the other forces of nature, or at least understanding them, in terms of quarks and leptons, three forces that act within the atom and the nuclei, the electromagnetic and the strong and the weak, <coughs> and the Higgs. And this standard model, standard theory of elementary particles is an incredible achievement comparable to Einstein's, I think, in totality. It works, could work, from the Planck scale, where gravity becomes important, to the edge of the universe. It's hard to find clues that it, where and how it goes wrong. We also have evidence that the forces, these three subatomic and atomic forces, unify as we extrapolate to shorter and shorter distances, higher energies, indeed where gravity becomes of equal strength. Gravity is such a weak force at low energies. The charge of gravity is energy, so it increases rapidly with energy. And uh, this, to my mind, is the most important clue we have as to where Einstein's goal might be realized, and of course is qualitatively realized in string theory. String theory being the, the most successful, some would argue, including me, the only successful attempt to quantize general relativity. But now it's really become a useful tool to both explore gravity perturbatively and non-perturbatively through the dual formulations of uh, the relations between string theory and field theory. Now let me end with Einstein's final legacy. One more legacy he left us with, which is both good and bad, useful and destructive. And that is celebrity. <laughs> Einstein became in 1990, already 1905, but by 1919, a worldwide celebrity figure in science that has never been matched since, probably never will be very special to the, that time in human history, World War II, World War I, German, pacifism, and Einstein himself as a character, as a man, as a humanist, as a politically involved person. Uh, <clears throat> and he permeates all of culture. You know, people describe a genius or somebody very smart as an Einstein become a verb or an adjective. And, you know, he actually enjoyed this, exploited it, used it. Not most, you know, a lot of the time he didn't, but, but he, he did not seclude himself in a, in a room and shut off himself from the world. He had too many important contributions to make. He met with everybody. Here he is in India meeting Tagore. I gather that conversation went nowhere. They talked like this. Here he is meeting Mahatma Gandhi, with whom he politically, I think, had a lot in common. But he circulated and met everyone. This is Einstein with the most famous celebrity in the world, Charlie Chaplin. Of course, he interacted in a critical and collaborative way with all the physicists of his time until he got to Princeton. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. Here he is at, at, uh, at, with Bohr at the 1927 Solvay Conference arguing about quantum mechanics. I know him. Here's a bunch of photos uh, the young Einstein with the youngish Madame Curie. Einstein giving the first Einstein Prize at the, you know, to Kurt Goodell <laughs> and Julian Schwinger. This is Einstein, I think at the Institute, probably just before his death with Isidore Rabi, Goodell, Wigner, Oppenheimer, 
and others. This is Einstein, also at the Institute with Johnny, John Wheeler and uh, Yukawa. But Einstein was engaged just not, not just in physics, but in society. He had a big heart. He was fervently cared about politics of all kinds and about helping people. He, of course, was a persona non grata in his native country of Germany, in effect thrown out and lucky to escape uh, when Hitler came to power. And the Nazis printed a postcard boasting about their expulsion of Einstein from Germany. Here it is. <laughs> this actually, as far as I know, didn't happen this way. But there is Hitler getting rid of Einstein. And they were very proud of that. They were going to make German science Judenfree. And they succeeded. This is Einstein as a Zionist. He believed, it, he believed very strongly in the uh, existence and the formation of a Jewish state. Here he is on his famous tour of America with uh, White Weizmann. And here he is being asked by Ben Gurion to be Israel's first president. A year or so or two before his death, he very wisely said, Thank you very much, but no. <laughs> and I have one more slide. I think we are lucky that Einstein, this great celebrity, was Einstein. We can all, as theoretical physicists, be enormously proud of the man who was chosen to be the person of the century, that he was one of us, really cared about physics, and yet was a great soul in Gandhi's terms. So enjoy the rest of the day. It's going to be marvelous. Thank you.